Hello, my beautiful computer science students. Welcome to another lesson in Unit 5, Writing Classes, where we are going to be diving into Lesson 4 and finally talking about static methods and variables. Those are our objectives for today. You can take a look at them, um, but we're going to dive right in, uh, first starting to talk about static methods. So static methods are associated with the class and not objects of the class. So up until this point in this unit, we have been creating, having an object creating class. We've been having variables and methods that deal directly with objects created from that class. Now we're going to move into static methods. And static methods are methods that can be run, but they are not associated with any sort of object. Okay? So if static methods, um, you call on a static method still with um, the dot notation. So if static methods are called with the class name followed by that dot notation, Java will go to that class and run the method present in whatever class was used in that dot notation. If you don't use the dot notation, in other words, if you call on a method but don't list the class name, Java will look inside whatever current class it's in for that method name. Okay. So you are calling on this method either with its class name or just calling on the method. And these methods can be run without any object present. Um, static methods include the keyword static in the header before the return type. Okay, so up to this point, we have not used that keyword static yet, and now here it is. In fact, actually, the only spot we have used it is in our main method, and that's because the main method is not associated with an object. The main method is just the method that runs, so it's static. Static methods cannot access or change any sort of instance variables or static variables. Okay? So static methods are just code, basically code that can be run um, whenever it is called on. It does not interact with object or object data. Okay? And remember that we're going to start including more methods now, but the main method is the only method that actually runs in a Java program. These static methods will not run unless they are called on through the main method or called on through another method. Okay. So here's going to be our first taste of a static method. So I want you to see what's going on here. First, we have two classes. Okay. We have public class statistics and we have public class data. Okay, so those two classes, and you can see inside those two classes, we're actually not making an object at all. There's no instance variables, there's no constructors, there's none of that, okay? In the statistics class, we do have our main method, okay, which is the only method that runs, okay? But then I have two other uh, methods. I have public static void operation, in the statistics class, and I have public static void operation in the data class. Okay. So I have basically the same um, uh, method name, but in two different classes. And it's going to do two different things. If you look in the code inside, it does two different things as well. So how do I know which one to run? Well, let's take a look at that. So again, the main method is the only one that runs, and the first statement is operation 3, 10, 20. So operation is a method call followed by those three parameters. And since I'm just calling on operation, I have no dot notation. That tells Java to look in the current class it's in, and it's currently in statistics, and run the operation class in there. So that's what's going to happen. It's going to take a jump and it's going to move into that operation method. And operation um, accepts three integers, so we passed it a 3, 10, and a 20. And that's what I've kind of written off over here is A gets 3, B gets 10, and C gets that 20. Okay? So then when I go to run double average equals, and then A plus B plus C divided by 3, my average is 11, right? 3 plus 10 plus 20 is going to be 33. 33 divided by 3 is 11, and then it's stored as a double. So average is going to be 11.0. And then I'm going to print off average 11.0. Okay? 
and that gets printed to the council. Now that line of code is done. Okay, we completed that line of code. So when you have that method call, it jumps to that method, all the code in that method runs, and we go back up to it. Now that method never returned anything, it just ran. Now I have a line that says data.operation. Okay, data.operation. So now I'm using that um, uh, method call, but I'm using it with a dot notation. And I'm calling on the data class. So you notice I use the class name, it says go to this class and run the method called operation. Okay, so I'm going to run this method now. So operation gets passed a 5, 6, and 7. So x is 5, y is 6, z is 7. And then I run the code in there. So sum is going to be 18 because I'm going to add all of those up. And then I'm going to print off a sum, which is 18. It's an integer. And then I'm going to be done. My last line of code, statistics.operation. So this is saying statistics, go to the statistics class, which you're currently in, and run the operation. Okay, So this basically does the same thing as this first line. It's kind of redundant to put that class name. But sometimes it's helpful so you're very specific about what method you want, right? especially as a programmer to know. So we're going to run that same operation method again. A is going to be 1, B is 5, C is 6. We're going to find the average. So that's going to be 12 divided by 3, which is 4, stored as a double, 4.0. Print off that average. There you go. Okay. And we're back to our main method, and we are done. And I have this little piece here um, says, recall, once a method is done running, all local variables get recycled, or what we call garbage collected. And that's why when we ran this method again, A, B, and C got new values. They were created again, right? They were declared here in the parameter list, and then they were assigned values in that parameter list, okay? They did not retain any of these values. Same thing with average, right? Average was declared and created again. It had no knowledge of what had happened before. That's what it means by garbage collected. After the method is done running, all of those local variables get tossed out, right? And they no longer exist. This is something that has kind of been present throughout um, the units we've been doing, but just note recalling again and remembering that's what happens. Okay. Let's look a little bit more about the, that local variable garbage collector idea. Okay. So I have my main method. Okay. I have in this main method, I'm going to have money. Double money is zero, so 0, 0 0.0, but semantics. I have five, or excuse me, four <laughs> four integers, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies that each get a value. And then I have a method call, okay? Quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies, and money all get passed to this calculate value method. Oops, excuse me, I didn't mean to cross it off. So quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies, and double money <laughs> gets a zero, okay? So that all of those values get passed into that calculate value. Okay, so there you go, 14530. So just keeping track, so now money is 0, Q is 1, D is 4, N is 5, P is 3. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to calculate money. Q times 25 cents, D times 10 cents, N times 5 cents, P times a petty. And that's going to calculate how much money I have which is going to be 0.93, okay? And then I'm going to use the line money in method money, okay? So here, money got changed due to this line, and then now I print off what's stored in money, 0.93, okay? Now, after that method runs, everything I just had over here is gone. Those are all local variables. Okay, so local variables get garbage collected after the method has run. Okay, so those go away. Now when I come back up, this line of code that I'm still at, it has finished running, the method has ran, and now I do my print line. And it says money after method, zero. Okay, why does it say zero? Because up in the main method, money is still zero. 
okay? So even if you have two variables floating around with the same name, different names, whatever it is, okay, local variables get garbage collected, okay? Two variables called money, each of them is a local variable. This money is local to um, the main method, and this money was local to um, this method right here, okay? Are, they're only able to be used in the method that was declared. So that's why we were able to have two variables with the same name, okay? You remember that's usually a no-no. Um, we were able to have two variables with the same name because they were both local variables, and so they're seen as different, okay? So it can get kind of confusing. That's usually why we say don't name them the same name, just so you don't get confused like that. Um, name one, money one, money two, if you really have to. But because they're local variables, they are both different. Okay. Now let's move on to the order of methods, okay? So we've been saying that the main method is the only method that runs, okay? Any other method will not run unless it's called on, okay? So if I'm looking at this public class does order matter, I see I have method A, main, method C, and method B. All of them are static. Okay? All of them have the keyword static because we're actually not using them on an object here. We're just going to call them. Okay? <coughs> no matter the order, um, Java, you can have static methods before your main method. You can have static methods after. Order does not matter. It is only the main method that runs. Okay? This is different than other programming languages where you have to have either all of the static methods on top or all of the static methods below. Um, but for Java, it doesn't matter. They can be anywhere main method runs, method B runs. So we go to method B and the council will print off a B because that's what, what's happening in method B. Then method A, we go to method A, we print off an A. Then we print off a D in the main method. And then we go to method C and print off a C. Hopefully that's fairly straightforward. Just trying to demonstrate that the order of the methods, whatever you put in, does not matter when, um, when you are writing them in your class. Okay, now let's talk about passing objects versus perimeters as parameters here, okay? So primitives, remember, are stored in memory directly. So if they are changed in a method, those changes are not preserved. And that's what we saw a couple slides ago when we were working with, um, I don't even remember now, when we were working with uh, nickels, dimes, pennies, quarters, right? We saw that. The changes in money were not preserved at all, okay? We just passed by value, okay? Um, when you're passing a primitive, the local variable is declared and initialized with a value, okay? So they're called pass by value. Okay. The local variable has no relationship with the variable back in the main method. Again, as we saw with our money variable. Okay. Garbage collected, variable no longer is, exists. And this also applies to strings. Even though strings are technically reference data types, remember strings are immutable. So they tend to behave like primitives and they behave like primitives in this case. Okay. So even though strings are reference, they still behave like primitives here. Okay. Objects are different. Objects are stored as references, so if they are changed in a method, those changes are in fact preserved. Okay, Because when an object reference gets passed, the local variable that is created points to the same location as the object reference. Okay? So it's not a value that's just copied. Okay? The actual locations are going to point to the same value. Okay. And any changes made to that local variable object will change the object's reference data as well. And we're going to see example of each of these, so don't you worry. Okay. So I have two methods here. I have a method called add one and I have a method called main. Okay. Well, we already know main is the one that gets, um, that gets run. So remember kind of a visual of what happens in memory here is I create an integer x and it gets the value of 9. When I go to the next line, it says add one x. Okay, add one x means I go to the go to the method add one, and I pass it the value of x. Okay, so this says I don't actually pass it the x itself, right? I pass it the value. So I give nine to that method, and that means that c gets the value of nine. 
right? So notice how nine, there was a copy made, basically. So now there's two nines. X has a nine, C has a nine, right? Passed by value, the value gets passed. So here, when C gets a plus plus, when C adds one to it, and then I print off a C, um, I'm printing off 10, okay? Because C became, became 10 there. And add one method has run. And now I go back and print off my X. My X is still nine, right? So I had 10 and nine print off to the council and that's passing a primitive. There were no changes made to this variable X, okay? So I said add one X and then print off an X. X is still nine, okay? X never got changed itself. And that's due to local variables and passing by values. Passing an object is different. Okay? So we're going to consider the following code segment that uses our dog object. Okay? So I have my main method, and I have a static method here called add1age. Okay? Notice how add1age, it accepts a dog object. Okay? <laughs> so this static method is not um, a method that the dog does. Right? It's not a behavior of the dog, so therefore it's not in the dog class. It just does something with a dog, okay? But it's not a behavior of a dog, so that's why it's static, and that's why it is outside of our object creating class, okay? <clears throat> so here's what's going to happen in our main method. I have a dog called Puppers. It's going to use the new dog. It's going to use the... Um, parameter constructor that accepts the name and the age, and then by default, good dog is going to be true. Remember that that constructor we had. And this is, again, kind of a visual of what happens in memory. Okay, Puppers is our reference, and it's pointing to the location of um, the data. When I do add one Puppers, okay, that means I pass it the reference Puppers, and Puppers goes into this D slot here. And D gets declared and is going to point to the same location as Puppers. And okay? that's the relationship between Puppers and D is that they're going to point to the same location in memory. <laughs> so now in that method add one age, okay, I run this line of code, D dot get age. Okay? So D's age is six. I'm going to add one to it, so that's seven. Okay, that's going to be seven. And then what do I do? I do d.setAge to be seven. Okay, so I'm using the accessors and the mutators to get the age and then to change it. So six is going to become seven. And then if I print off d.getAge, okay, well, d's age is now seven. So I'm going to print off a seven. I go back to the main method, and if I were to do puppers.getAge, okay, so notice how the D reference is gone now, okay, because the D is still a local variable, and it's gone, it got garbage collected, but when I go back to get puppers.getAge, puppers age is also going to be a 7. It was changed in the other method, okay, and changes are preserved when they're acting on an object. Ooh, exciting stuff, right? Yeah. So passing a primitive versus, versus passing an object, two different, um, two different outcomes there. Both are still working with local variables, okay? but are the changes preserved or are they not preserved? They are not preserved with a primitive because they are passed by value. They are preserved with an object because they are passed by reference. Next fun topic of um, static methods here is method overloading. Okay. So method overloading is when methods have the same name but accept different parameters. Okay. So we're not talking about objects, or excuse me, no, we're not talking about objects at all. We're not talking about methods that are the same name but different classes like we saw with statistics and operation. Operation was the same name but different classes. That's not method overloading. Okay. Method overloading is when they have the same name except different parameters and they're in the same class. 
Okay. Java will decide which method to run based on the number and type of arguments that a method has. Method overloading does not work when the only difference is the return type or the parameter variable names. Okay. Java only distinguishes between the number, so the amount of arguments, and the type of those arguments. Okay. So here's my fun example. Area madness, this is called. So I have my main method, and then I have three methods here. Notice that they are all called area. Okay. All called area. You can see real quickly that each return statement, it does something different with the area. But the parameters, this accepts one integer. This accepts two integers. And this accepts two doubles. Okay. So this is method overloading, where they have the same name, but they accept different parameters. Okay, These accept a different number of parameters. These accept different types of parameters. So when you go to your first line in your main method, um, it says area4. It has a method called area4. Which area method does it run? Well, Java, luckily, is smart enough to say, go to the area method that accepts an integer. So it's going to go to this one right here, the area method that accepts one integer. So side is going to be a 4. So 4 times 4 is 16. It's going to return 16. Okay, So A1 gets the value of 16, 16.0 because it's a double. right? Now for this one, it, it, area 5.0 and 6.0. So two doubles. So it knows to go to the area with two doubles. Width is 5.0, height is 6.0. Okay. So we put those in. 5.0 times 6.0 is 30.0, divided by 2, 15.0, return it. That's the value of A2. Here, you can see where this go is going. Area, 3, 4, two integers, goes to the method that accepts two integers. 3 is width, 4 is height, gives you 12, stored in a double. 12.0 is your A3. And that A4, what happens here? Because there's no method that has a 1.0 and a 2. So no method that has a double, comma, integer. So which one does it choose? It chooses the double one, OK? For, method, for this method call, since Java doesn't find a double comma int, it would look for the double comma int first. It would go through. And since there's no double comma int, the next option for Java is to promote the integer. Okay, Because remember, an integer fits into a double. So it would say, OK, promote the, promote the int. Is there a double double? <coughs> and there is. So that's why this method is going to get run again. With 1.0 as the width, 2 as the height, we go through 1 is the area for A4, and we print off those four values. <laughs> area madness, right? Method overloading. Okay. Now let's look at some extra methods here. Okay. So we already used these. These are the three we just used. Okay. I'm just kind of repeating them on this slide here. Okay. Which of the following of these three would be legal or illegal to add to area madness? Okay, so basically, which of the following are legal and illegal? So choose which is which. So here we have public static double area. Now I accept a double side. Okay, so I'm only looking at the parameter amount and the type. Is there a parameter that already has? Is there a method that already has one parameter? Yes. Are they two different types? Yes. One's an int, one's a double. So this is legal because the parameter is different. Okay. Here, I go to this int side. Okay. Is there another area that accepts a single integer? And there is. Okay. <coughs> What's different about this? It's the return type. So is this legal or illegal? Illegal. Because this parameter has already been used. Okay, I've already had a single int parameter, so I can't make another method with a single int parameter, even if the return types are different. 
Return types don't matter for overloading. <laughs> it's all about the parameter and type. For this one, two integers, okay? Um, I already have two integers, but I called them something different. I called this width, and I called this w, and I called this height, and I called this h, okay? Does that make a difference? No, this is still illegal, okay? Because there's still a method with two integer parameters that already exist, okay? So this would be illegal. I could not add this to my class. All right, now we're getting into returning before the end, okay? So this is um, a property of actually all methods, not just static methods, but any type of method. Um, so I have two types of code here. One works properly and one doesn't, and they both look very similar. <laughs> so this is a, um, a method called max. It accepts two integers. If a is greater than or equal to b, it's gonna return a meaning it's the max. Else, it's going to return b, okay? Because if this isn't true, then that means that b is the max, okay? So when you have an if-else statement, one of the statements is guaranteed to run, okay? If you have an if and then an else. And because one of those statements is guaranteed to run, you are guaranteed to return a value, okay? And that's what Java needs to see. It needs to see a guarantee on that return statement. If you look over here, the logic is sound, right? If A is greater than B, return A. If A is less than B, return B, right? So it finds the max logically correctly, but this will not work correctly in Java as code. You'll have a syntax error because you have two if statements. You, Java sees those and says, okay, I have my return statements inside if statements. They're not guaranteed to run, okay? Java can't read this and understand the human logic behind it. It sees two if statements and, say, and says, hey, an if statement might not run, which means if I'm looking at this code, I might not return a value. So this would be a compiler error because of that, okay? So something to keep in mind with all methods, not just static methods, but with all methods, you have to be guaranteed a return type. And it's the same thing if I involved loops here, okay? If I was trying to determine if a value was prime or not, okay? So if I look in here, this works properly because I have my for loop. I have my if statement, which may or may not run, but then I have my return statement on the outside, okay? The for loop is never guaranteed to run, okay? And the if statement is never guaranteed to go, okay, right, or to trigger. But this is, right, I have the return true outside of all of that that will for sure run even if everything else, even if I don't enter my loop or even if my if statement isn't, isn't triggered, okay? So that would be okay. Over here, again, notice how the logic of it seems sound, right, if else. Okay, kind of like what I just said, you have to have an if else with return false or return true. But the issue is with the for loop. A for loop is not guaranteed to run, okay? Um, again, even though you see here i is two, i less than x, x i plus plus, if x was one, this loop would never run, okay? And then I never have a return statement. So that's why it's a compiler error here. So just be careful with those return statements for all methods. Felt like a good time to kind of throw that in. Remember that the return command ends a method immediately. <coughs> no code can follow a return statement in a code block. Okay. So what I mean by that, because obviously I have a return statement here, and then I have stuff after that return statement. But the difference is that this is a return statement in this if block. Okay, this is a return statement in the method block. Okay, this is a return statement in the if block, or in the else block, excuse me. <laughs> I can't have any code after that. So like after this, I can't have X like plus plus here, okay? If I tried to have anything after a return statement, I would get a compiler error, okay? So no code can follow a return statement in a code block. Okay, you can have a return statement in a void method, um, it just looks like this, return, 
Okay, return with the, the colons, um, or excuse me, the semicolon after that. And, um, or return void sometimes. And the reason you might put that in is just to end a method immediately for some reason. Okay. Okay, now let's get to static variables. And this is going to be our last topic for this set of this lesson. Okay. So a static variable belongs to a class, not a specific instance of a class, like an object. Um, static variable belongs to a class in much the same way that a static method belongs to a class. A static variable belongs to a class, but you can have static variables inside an object creating class. Okay? They can go in either object creating classes or in regular classes. If they're in an object creating class, all instances of a class share that static variable. So if you had a static, we'll see here in a few moments an example, if you had a static variable inside a dog object, every dog that is created doesn't have that static variable. It's a static variable that belongs to the dog class itself. Okay, and We'll see again an example of that. They can be public or private. They have the keyword static before the variable type. Um, and if it's public, you can call in it still using the dot notation with the class name, dot, and then whatever that static variable name is. Okay. Um, and again, they can be in an object creating class or a non-object creating class. Okay? And I'm going to show you two examples, one being used of each. So here's an example of it being used in just a regular class. Okay. The variable mean is created as a static variable in a non-object class. Okay, so this is the class statistics. I have my main method and I have a method average, a static method average. So I have this double mean. So notice it's um it's very a, very much a global variable, okay? Uh, meaning it can be used anywhere inside inside this class. All changes to the mean in this example mean are persistent, meaning that any changes made in one method will permanently change the variable for the whole um, the whole run of the code. Okay, so here mean gets the value of zero. Okay, so when the main method runs, any static variables that were created are going to be um, um, cr created and assigned values. I guess yeah. <laughs> so here, average one three eleven gets passed to the method um, mean. 1 plus 3 plus 11 divided by 3, right, is going to be 5. And then that means the mean is going to be 5. Okay, it's a double, so it's 5.0. So when I print it off, it's a 5.0. Then I add 2 to it, and then I print it off again, it's a 7.0. Okay, so notice how I changed the mean in the method, but then when I went back up here, the mean was changed. Okay, I changed in the method and the changes persisted because it's a global variable. It's a static variable. Okay. The last example here is using the dog. Okay. I have a static int count dogs. Okay. So I have my three instance variables here, but now I have a static variable in my object creating class. It's called count dogs. And an example of how I might use this, the static variable is going to count how many dog objects are created. So when a dog is created, it only gets the instance variables. Okay, it does not get any static variables. Okay, um, so what happens is like when I have my default parameter here, my instance variables get default values, and I add one to count dogs because I'm counting how many dog objects get created. To access count dogs, use the statement dog dot count dogs. Okay, dog is the name of the class. Count dog is your static variable. Okay, in this case, I don't have the keyword private in front of static, so that means it's by default public. If it was private, you would have to create accessors and mutators in order to see it from another class. Okay, or to potentially change it from another class. And that's it. That's it for lesson four, static methods and variables. Um, thank you guys again for watching and I hope you have a great day.